Um, it's an extraordinary um, honour to be invited to um, Siena, and I hadn't realised it was the anniversary of Ricardo's death today. Um, Ricardo was one of the great archaeologists of Italy in the um, second half of the 20th century. Oh, you can't hear me. Sorry. Um, Ricardo was one of the great archaeologists of the second half of the 20th century, and I think all of us who um, have anything to do with landscape archaeology um, will recognise his immense contribution uh, both to the subject and to Siena. I couldn't start without uh, <laughs> saying that. Um, I'm a new boy at CAA, sorry Gary, um, and it's probably uh, worth saying a little bit about why I think this conference is tremendously important, um, which gives some uh, explanation for uh, my uh, lecture title, which you'll note has a question mark at the end. Uh, my background as an archaeologist is quite complicated. Um, I'm an archaeologist of the Roman world. I'm interested in particular in the relationship between um, indigenous populations and Roman power. Um, given the size of the Roman world and the nature of Roman imperial power, that is a historic complex that is written on the landscape. So for me, the landscape is not just the background, it is part of the story of Roman imperial power. My own um, interests in the different aspects of archaeology have... Shall we, we'll just wait, then we can... So it's the, it's the, the manual technology that's really important here. <laughs> Thank you so much. That's, can, can everyone hear me better now? Um, my own personal history in archaeology, I started off, um, and I just tried to work it out, Gary, I must have started off in archaeology before CAA started, when I was at school and I was digging. And um, I have maintained an interest in digging and an active role in it um, ever since about 1970. Um, this is important because I'm going to attack digging later on in the lecture. Um, but I, through digging, I became interested in artefacts and particularly pottery. And one of those um, confessions, if you promise not to tell anyone about it, um, is that I did my doctorate on multivariate statistical analysis of pottery um, um, for... for for Gary's uh, interest with an Oxford line here, I was supervised in Oxford by the late, now late, Professor Shepard Freer, who was a man who was not sympathetic to computers and didn't know what I was doing, really. Um, but that's, that's the way that doctorates used to be supervised. Um, and I, I moved away from computing, and I really haven't done anything innovative with a computer since about 1978, which is why I'm here in front of you. But as my um, interest in computers sort of became much more concerned with the word processor rather than the um, statistical analysis in the late 1970s, I got very engaged in um, surface archaeology, field survey, surface collection, and so forth, and um, through that got into uh, interest in geophysical surveys. And what I want to argue today is that if we're going to have a proper landscape archaeology, we need actually to rethink the integration of all those different aspects, excavation, analysis of finds, um, surface collection, and geophysics. And um, just as a, a I've spent quite a lot of time researching this, but I haven't come up with the right answer. I know um, that I could have been the person in that um, slide with Tony Clark in the early 
the 70s. This is from his, um, his popular book on uh, geophysics. Because while I was digging with my local archaeological society, Tony Clark was a local to um, our area in Surrey. And um, he brought out a Martin Clark uh, resistance meter, which was my first introduction to geophysical survey, which must have been in about 1971 or 72. Um, for those of you who aren't aware of how the technology worked then, you had a wonderful little box with um, a rotor switch on it, and there were nine wires that came out of the rotor switch which were colour-coded that had to be hooked onto a probe. You took a reading, wrote it down, the kid at the end, who could have been me but isn't, lifts up the probe, moves it down the line, the rotation switch moves round and you move on down the field. There are two problems with this. Um, has anyone else in the room ever used a Martin Clark meter? Yeah, I don't, up at the back there. Um, there are two problems. One is that the, it turns into spaghetti, which is particularly appropriate for Siena, I suppose. Um, and by the time you've done about 20 readings, the whole lot is they're also colour coded and I'm colour blind <laughs> so my, my, my early um, adventures into uh, geophysical survey came to nothing and only picked up um, actually later with um, work with kit designed by Arnold Aspinall in the um, 1970s at, uh, uh, in it, first in Spain um, and later in the UK the point here is that I'm a landscape archaeologist through and through. I've had some intersections with um, what you guys do um, brilliantly. And I must say that the programme for this conference is stupendous, just showing uh, the life and uh, activity that's going on and the vibrancy of these aspects of archaeology now. Um, but what I want to argue today is that if we are going to take full advantage of the technologies that your guys are developing, cutting edge of the subject, we really do need to go back to basics and rethink some of the aspects um, that make up landscape archaeology. And this is, um, to some extent, um, going to be um, a game of moving backwards and forwards through time from where I think problems are at present to pick up, in some cases, bits of work that were done quite a long time ago that looked as though they were um, dead ends, which I think um, uh, need revisiting and are relevant today. But my theme is, in a sense, um, uh, given by, by this um, quote from um, Wittgenstein um, about psychology, and I've been working all day to see whether I could get a joke about former psychiatric hospitals, psychology, Wittgenstein, and uh, digital archaeology. I can't work it out. But Wittgenstein's point here is perfectly straightforward. That from, and if you substitute landscape archaeology for psychology in the quote, um, at the moment, landscape archaeology just doesn't seem to work. It's a, um, confusion and bareness of landscape archaeology is not to be explained by calling it a young science, for in landscape archaeology there are experimental methods and conceptual confusion. The existence of the experimental methods makes us think we have the means of solving the problems which trouble us, though problem and method pass one another by. Um, I think it's a, a really profound quote, and it summarises, in a sense, what um, I think we need to think the fundamentals of what we're doing. And to uh, paraphrase what Stefano said in his introduction, we're here as archaeologists to use technique in order to understand the past. And if we're going to understand the past, we need to have the right questions as well as the right methods for doing it. And I think they, this could be approached in many ways by saying, why are we where we are at the moment with um, landscape archaeology, and particularly archaeological geophysics? Now, I'll then look briefly at um, air photography and surf, field survey 
as um, complements to it. And um, it seems to me that uh, we, we're using technologies, for the most part, that were um, invented quite a long time ago. They're not um, fundamentally particularly complicated, but they have been made um, immensely more powerful as computers have developed. So when you um, think of us using um, a Brad Fizz resistivity meter on the slide here in Spain in 1982, um, there wasn't a computer to process the stuff in the field. Um, there was certainly no data logger. So these guys here, one person is going along shouting out the reading, we're writing it down. And um, all the mapping was done, um, if you were going to do it to use for the next day, um, you did uh, pencil contour maps of the uh, numbers um, on the process sheets um, in the evening. And of course, um, computing power and so forth has moved on radically so that we can process the data, but it, essentially most of it's quite simple data. The reason that it grew in Northern Europe is that there was a commercial imperative. And in particular, in the UK, the commercial imperative came about because of changes in planning law, which required um, survey to be done before development went ahead. And that's spread to, um, in different ways to other parts of Europe. But the development of fast geophysics was because, not because archaeologists were interested in it, but because the developers were interested in it. And under that commercial imperative, um, the archaeologist and the development processes have tended to conspire to make us think about sites. Now, I really worried about what an archaeological site is. I've been worried about it for years. Um, most of the time when we talk about an archaeological site, we are implicitly talking about somewhere where we would like to dig or like to prevent someone else from digging. Um, somewhere where there is a nexus of, of human activity, but it's a focus in the landscape. But we're, we're very bad about being explicit what we mean about sites. And in the development process, people want to know where they can't develop things, so they're looking for the sites that will are getting in their way. And as archaeologists, we're tending towards um, being interested in digging things, or have been for much of the past. So we too are looking for the hot spots in the landscape. Furthermore, in the early development of these techniques, where you couldn't do things on a landscape scale, you did your geophysics, whatever, in the area which was most likely to produce results. Therefore, you focused again on the, the site. And quite a lot of the time, that focus also moved out from, I'm digging this trench, I want to know where that wall's going, where, how this fits into a broader thing. So the site gets stretched outwards by the uh, use of geophysics. I think this is um, a fundamental problem in the way that we still think about things. Because as geophysics has expanded, so that we can cover, in Stefano's case, or uh, Dominic's case up at the back there, um, large areas of landscape um, with uh, radiometry, or we can get, as in the uh, case of the um, Boltzmann Institute in Vienna, this fantastic work of um, georadar, where we can see um, amazingly crisp results through different depths. We have always tended to work on the site and thinking about finding out more about sites. There are very few people that have moved beyond the sites to say, now we can do geophysical survey across whole landscapes. But when they've done it, although there is a tendency now to recognize that geophysical survey can tell us about large areas and that we can perhaps begin to start looking at the whole 
carpet of the past um, spreading across the landscape. There is still a tendency to focus on the hot spots in the geophysics, although there are instances like Stefano's current project where we're looking at the blanks in the landscape as well. But the focus is always in on the bit where people are living, not necessarily the other bits that they're using in other ways. And it's interesting to contrast that with the way that um, aerial photography has also developed. Uh, aerial photography starts off as being very opportunistic. Um, the tradition of French air photography, the tradition of English air photography um, with OGS Crawford, um, it starts off with military um, personnel using military planes thinking, ah, oh, look, we can see things from the sky. And um, this is a very early OGS Crawford air photograph of um, field systems um, in southern England. But um, we all recognise the issues of the way in which air photographic data is determined by the environment on the ground, what's visible, what's seen. And the issues, at least in uh, air photography until comparatively recently, of lack of systematic control of what you can see. Um, things that have moved forward very rapidly recently. But it, what's interesting is that um, as air photography developed, although the bits of the landscape where things are visible um, include things like field systems and trackways and so forth, the main focus of it has always come back to the site, the focus of human activity in the landscape. And that um, I find particularly odd given the nature of the landscape as seen from, from above in uh, aeroplanes and so forth. The third area where we have <coughs> big landscape work is of course field survey, surface collection. And um, in this part of Italy, uh, surface collection uh, remains immensely important research technique and in many ways the um, sophistication of surface collection archaeology um, owes its um, sort of success to uh, the Mediterranean landscapes. Um, the, the work that um, John Wood Perkins did uh, from the British School at Rome in the 1950s that's taken off as a tradition of landscape archaeology in Italy and elsewhere in the Mediterranean. But again, when you field walk a landscape, you field walk a continuity of human use of the landscape. Okay, it tends to be biased towards areas of arable farming and so forth. There are gaps in areas of woodlands and so forth. But you are engaging with the landscape in an extraordinarily direct way by walking across it. Yet, at the same time, what people have focused on is finding hot spots in the landscape, the places that they can call site. And that has been one of the reasons that field survey in the Mediterranean has been so popular, because by putting dots on maps and being able to date those dots on maps, people have been able to relate um, field archaeological practice to big historical questions, the scale of the uh, Roman population, for instance, the impact of the city of Rome on its hinterland, as in Tim Potter's uh, famous um, Changing Landscapes of South Etruria. Um, so there has been um, a success in doing archaeology in a way that appeals to other academic communities. And that success has reinforced the emphasis on settlement sites and dots on maps. And there have been some very good critiques of this. I think Rob Witcher's recent critique of the dots on maps approach to survey. But at the same time, 
um, in a way that we don't see with other aspects of uh, survey archaeology. Um, the uh, tradition in landscape archaeology has been very reflexive. There has been a lot written about how material gets onto the surface, how to interpret it, what the problems are, so forth. Very often, it's tended to be a rather negative thing. And there is a bit of a loss of confidence, um, a crisis of confidence in field survey archaeology um, in recent years at Tech. And again, uh, I think particularly of the work of the um, Roman peasant project in this part of Italy, which has gone out and looked at um, a whole series of hotspots in the landscape sites, if you will, um, sampled them with excavation and come up with things that they didn't expect, with the conclusion drawn that that may mean that field survey doesn't work. Uh, interestingly, um, and this is a point I want to come back to, that um, loss of confidence um, has partly lost touch with some of the really interesting um, reflexive work that was done in the 1980s um, about how landscapes develop the relationship between surface and subsurface assemblages, um, which I think we need to come back to. But before um, thinking about that, I want to make a couple of um, comments that I hope are um, barbed about current practice in landscape archaeology overall. Um, I think that in all kinds of survey archaeology, geophysics, aerial survey and field survey, there is still some very odd hangover from positivism around. People thinking that um, if we observe something, it's some form of truth, and if we have better observations, we'll have something that is much closer <coughs> to truth. And this seems to me to be particularly worrying, and it's particularly um, noticeable in a term that um, sends my blood temperature rising um, steadily, which is the term um, ground truthing. Now, if you stand back for a moment and say, ground truthing, what is the intellectual baggage behind that? It is a positivist intellectual baggage that we could find the truth by doing something. Now, as I said right at the beginning, my first introduction to archaeology was digging. So I'm digging in my blood. Um, ground truthing generally involves, I have done this survey, geophysics, be, whichever method I've used, I've done this surface collection, whichever method you've used, I have found something, I'm now going to dig a hole to find out whether that is there. Um, now, um, I'm not going to say where this site in Northern England in the winter of 2015 is, but it sort of sums up um, the truth of digging for me. That anyone who has ever dug a small hole knows that the one thing that you do not get out of it is truth. <laughs> digging small holes is a very, very bad way of proving or disproving anything in archaeology. And it's even worse in the winter in northern England on a wet clay subsoil, where um, the mess around digging means that um, truth is a is very, very fugitive concept. Now, I use that as a, a focused example, but I don't believe that digging tells us anything truer about the archaeology that we're looking at than other methods. What it does is it tells us something different. It gives us a different set of information. 
And before exploring that a little bit further, I also want to make the point that unless you do a huge excavation in a landscape, you clear um, hectares and hectares of landscape, as archaeological survey moves on to a landscape scale, the size of the sample that you can dig becomes a smaller and smaller and smaller proportion of the totality of what we're looking at. So I think our excavation is important, but please, please, please don't call it ground truthing. Please call it a collection of a complementary set of information. Because when we look at any past landscape, we collect one set of data about it, we have to acknowledge that that set of data is not the whole what's there. Now, you can do gradiometry on a grand scale as at Portus here, um, and you can see lots of archaeological features coming through. It so happens that if you go up in the right circumstances at the right time of year with an aeroplane and you photograph the same thing, you see a whole load of other things that don't show up in the gradiometry. And I can be absolutely certain also that if we um, subjected this to uh, soil resistance survey or radar, we would get different sets of data. They're complementary, and what you get from digging a hole is also complementary to that, particularly bearing in mind um, that a lot of the stuff that we're dealing with in landscape archaeology was never anywhere else than in the top 20, 30 centimetres of the plough soil. And when you talk about ground truthing with large scale um, excavation and someone then moves in with a machine, as they commonly do in commercial archaeology and digs a long trench across it, they dump the archaeology that you have just measured with the geophysics of the surface so in a spoil heap and they get in and look at what's left in the bottom. Okay? Um, this is lousy methodology and what we need to do is to be thinking about how we get the maximum out of site, which includes um, excavation but we need to think about it as a landscape. And this brings me to my second point, which I think is important, which goes back, as uh, the next slide will, to, to really interesting pieces of work that were done in the 1980s, and bits of work that were done before we had the computing power to deal with large data sets. And um, I have on the this side of the screen, um, a picture from a paper by Rob Foley about hunter-gatherer communities and the way they use landscapes. And superimposed behind it is the sort of flint distribution that you will get in the landscape. <laughs> now, Rob's point was absolutely straightforward, that a hunter-gatherer community is not sedentary, it's moving through the landscape, it is following the herds, it's hunting in different places, it's stopping in different places, it's seasonal, it's a complex society which uses the landscape, the whole landscape, in all kinds of different ways. And when we sample that landscape through field survey, um, we need to recognise that we're not looking at sites, we're looking at people using the landscape. And by using the landscape in different ways, they leave residues that if we are intelligent in our approach to it, we can try and understand what's going on. The same is true of complex societies. Does anyone here live in a site? You don't. You inhabit a landscape. We're a global society. We move all over the place. In our locale, if we're a farming community, we have a base where we keep our farm equipment, our animals, where we live, but we move out into the fields, we use the fields in different ways, we use the woodland, we use the water resources and so forth. Human beings 
inhabit the whole landscape, they don't inhabit sites. So what we've got to do if we are going to move towards a new landscape archaeology is we've got to go back to the thinking about how people use the whole landscape. Uh, uh, I'm sorry, I couldn't resist putting the blind alley of manuring down there for those of you who do surface archaeology where everyone argues about whether the bits are to do with manure spread across the fields, which they might be, and that's important in the way you look at the landscape. But um, then everyone <coughs> argues that everything is either a manured landscape or a settled landscape without thinking, hang on, let's stand, look and see how this farming community must have used that landscape in the past, and then interrogate what you're finding in order to understand or try to understand what's going on. Now, for me, there are three pillars the way that we do landscape archaeology. We can look at it remotely <laughs> either from above or on the surface and use geophysical techniques or air photographic techniques, um, but remotely. We can work on the surface collecting the material that is in the ground surface, and we could excavate. I've already suggested that although excavation has a role, I don't believe it tells you the truth any more than I think any of the other methods do. But I think one of the things we've lost is the natural complementarity between surface collection and remote sensing techniques. That we should be collecting material off the surface to understand other aspects of what's going on through traditional field walking methods. And here, I think there is a quite interesting lesson to be learned that most of us who do field walking work work and have done for many years on some form of grid collection system. Now, this goes back to the periods where um, you, you, had to, um, you had to map it by 30 meter grids because you couldn't plot individual finds. Now, I'm not deluded. I have worked on Mediterranean surveys where there is so much stuff on the surface that um, you couldn't plot every single object. But there was some very interesting work done um, 30 years or so ago at Maxi um, by uh, Francis Pryor and Dave Crowther and Paul Lane, where they field walked an area and they plotted every single artifact before they dug the site. Um, no one reads this anymore, but it's one of the fundamental pieces of work that demonstrates that lots of the finds were in the topsoil, they weren't in subsoil features, and it explores the dynamics of that process. And that was done at the stage where um, I think everything was tape measured in and used a handheld theodolite. Now, as Dominic has shown in his excavations in um, Yorkshire, you can um, locate um, hundreds of thousands of objects individually. And if we did this uh, surface collection, I don't think we'd need to do it everywhere, but um, did some further experiments doing this with remote sense data as well as with excavated data, we could get a lot further forward in understanding the processes that create the archaeology as we see it. And we could, I think, um, re-enliven um, both survey archaeology and uh, landscape archaeology as a whole. And it's important to recognise that some of that work that was done in the 80s when people were thinking about field survey in different ways is really worth revisiting. The Crowther, French and Prior stuff from Maxi is, I uh, reread it last week, it's extraordinarily good um, a piece of work, uh, which if replicated with the sort of technology for data collection we've got now on a grand scale, we could really do some, some very interesting things. Um, I probably ranted too much, um, but I want to make one further point about landscape. And that is that if we're going to 
think about the way people use the landscape. And we have the technology for doing this on an amazingly large scale now. We need to think about the relationship between humans and the landscape in a much, much more critical way. And I think here, um, we've got to move beyond thinking about the landscape just as the bit that is a bit like a film set behind you. We've got to understand that until the Industrial Revolution, people's relationship with their landscape was intimate and close. And they were using landscapes in the way that we use artefacts. A lot of archaeological theory has now moved towards the agency of the artefact, the way in which objects make us do things. And we are not simply using objects, we're having a, a, a sort of interchange, in a sense, with them in developing our behaviour. And I want to make the point that the same is true with your landscape. The landscape is something that makes us human and we make that landscape. It's a, a recursive relationship and landscape has agency. Um, you only have to walk across a wet, muddy clay field to know that it changes the way you walk. Um, the, the landscape affects what we're doing, it creates what we're doing, and when we're looking at the landscape as archaeologists, we need to do that. And that goes far beyond the sort of um, rather weak phenomenological stuff about looking at the landscape and sort of empathising with it. We need to really get to grips with understanding it. And if we're going to do that, we also need to come to grips with the need to um, use different levels of resolution of evidence for different questions. If we're thinking about um, a very local area, I'm looking at a Roman town in Yorkshire that we're surveying at the moment, we need very, very high resolution information about that. As we move into areas, for instance, of wetlands or woodlands or fields, we arguably um, can use different resolution of data. And we need to be much more creative about thinking about the resolution of evidence that we require for the uh, landscapes we're approaching. And finally, we need to be much more thoughtful about our questions. I've already made the point that one of the reasons that I think that uh, surface collection um, ended up down a bit of a blind alley is that it became, fell in love with by ancient historians who are interested in population. And we, we were fed on that habit of going and collecting more dots on maps to try and work out ancient population levels. I think we've got to team up with historians and others who are interested in the past, but it's very important that we are not simply driven by their questions, but we can define the types of questions that we can approach. And this is where CAA is phenomenally important. You are at the cutting edge of the way in which archaeology can be done. But there's a bit of a danger as I look back through past CAA conferences of people getting um, very carried away with what can be done because it can be done rather than getting carried away with what computer-based work can do to redefine questions, create new questions, and address um, questions that have, uh, we've been unsuccessful with in the past. And I think um, in order to have a confident new landscape archaeologist, uh, archaeology, <coughs> we've got to have a much, much more um, grown-up approach, both by those of you who are driving the technology and those of us who are using it, so that we can assess what questions we can appropriately address and work with them um, rather more effectively. And for me, um, there are examples of the right route to doing this, um, and I've got um, 
part of Dominic's Atlas of the Vale of Pickering um, as my last slide here, showing what can be done in mapping um, huge landscapes and mapping them in an integrated um, way. But even with that example, for me, there are huge elements missing. What do those things um, on that landscape tell us about perceptions of the landscape? We can pick those out, the wetlands that are used in different ways from the hills and so forth. But we, we've got to ask the question about perceptions. We've also got to think about how communities exploited complementary bits of the landscape, both within their own lives and as societies become more complex in um, the different blocks that make up those societies. So woodland resources, salt resources and so forth, um, which we're not very good at, at getting at through our me current methods landscape archaeology. And we need to recognise that even those hunter-gatherer societies operated over quite a large um, range. Complex societies like the Roman Empire work over the whole empire. And we need to understand not only the macro flows of goods through the Roman Empire, but how goods flowed through local landscapes. So, for instance, in the work that we've been doing in Yorkshire in the last few years, we can, I think, by combining techniques, show where resources are coming from in one region to be brought into another and feeding into Roman um, taxation and trade networks. If we think about material moving through the landscape rather than simply material being evidence for past use of the landscape, pots weren't dropped on the surface in order to date the sites for archaeologists. There are other reasons that pots were there, and how they got there is part of the landscape archaeology. And if we go back to my um, long-term interest in uh, society of the Roman world, can we tell through the shapes of the way that the landscape is organised how different modes of Roman landscape control and other societies' control of the landscape work. Now, that little cluster of questions at the end are just mine. Um, what I don't want to do is to um, encourage a sort of uh, outsider coming in and infantilising you lot by telling you what questions you've got to ask. What I'm saying is that if we're going to have the new landscape archaeology that you people can deliver or help deliver, we've got to work together and you can drive the sorts of questions we ask as much as um, my ancient historian colleagues. But if we do that, if we capitalise on cutting-edge method, we can um, recognise how we've got to where we are through the history of the subject and thereby move it on rather than being victims of the history of the development of geophysics or victims of the development of air photography and so forth. We are, um, in my view, on the verge of um, a whole new world of landscape archaeology. And with that, I'll sit down. Thank you. Thank you.